So we've seen quite a wide range of views of what people think the world's going to look like 10 or even 100 years in the future. So Paul, I think it's time for us to think about this, and why not start with you? Paul, what is the world, our view of the world, going to look like 10 years from now? What's fundamentally going to have changed? Well, I think for astronomy, I think that the big thing I'm going to see in the next 10 years, I reckon, I'll probably be wrong, is finding solar system analogs for exoplanets. At the moment, we've found hot Jupiters, um, we found super-Earths. We're, we're just on the brink of being able to find other solar systems like our own, with Earth-like planets and Jupiter-like things and Jupiter-like orbits. We're just on the hairy edge. So, so do you think our solar system's going to be common, or do you think it's going to be kind of rare? If I, had, if I was a betting man, which I am not, yeah. I would say fairly common. Yeah. But uh, I think we're beginning to get the few hints that not 100%, maybe not even 50%, but I think there are going to be a lot of things, at least superficially, like our own solar system out there. Right. And do you think we're going to be able to use the new technology? What do you think we're going to be able to do when we study these solar systems with the new extremely large telescope, JWST, ALMA, all these square kilometer array? I think we're going to be able to find solar system analogues and probably find Earth-like planets maybe via microlensing or um, more precise radio velocities around dwarf stars and so on. On the next 10 years, we're not going to be able to learn anything about Earth analogues. But I think we are going to learn a lot more about the bigger planets around these things. We're going to get much better, particularly imaging. We're going to be able to see a lot more of these things and what their spectra are like. And so we're actually they're going to st stop being just a list of M sine I and uh, radius and actually s start being fleshed out as actual real worlds with atmospheres and rotation and temperatures and things like that. Do you think we're going to be able to you know, have a theory that really explains why there are so many, uh, you know, hot Jupiters, why there are stars of all these different masses? I mean, you, th you think us getting well, that new data will allow us to really develop good theory? I don't think we're going to have a, a sudden breakthrough on this. I think it's going to get better, and yep. we're going to get more pieces in place, but this is just really messy physics, and so it relies on physics all the way from micro scale up to scales of parsecs. And even if you extrapolate Moore's law forward 10 years, the computers are not going to be fast enough even then to really simulate the full range. They'll be getting closer. We'll have a better understanding. But I think this is something that's going to improve gradually, step by step over decades. It's not, I'd be surprised if there's a sudden breakthrough and everything falls into place. Very pleasantly surprised, but I'm not holding my breath. Okay. So let's be more speculative. Let's look to that 100-year time scale. What are we going to know? What's the big, big things we're going to learn about 100 years from now? Mm -hmm. Well, something that interests me, actually, is the human aspect in this. Because on that sort of time scale, it's not at all clear it's humans that are going to be doing the discovery so much as some sort of human-machine hybrid. I mean, if you think about all the barriers that's going to stop us progressing, I mean, we could end up in a situation like particle physics where we've built the biggest telescopes we possibly can. We've, um, I mean, if you look at where astronomy has made progress over the past, I'd say in the early part of the 20th century, the progress is mostly coming out of physics. Physicists discovered new nuclear physics and quantum mechanics, and we imported those things and allowed us to explain things we'd known about for a long time but not been able to understand. Yeah. That kind of stopped by 1950, but say from 1950 through to... 2000, a lot of progress was driven by opening up the electromagnetic spectrum. We could suddenly observe many wavelengths we hadn't done. So first radio astronomy, then x-ray astronomy, infrared, submillimeter, microwave background. But we now have done, we have the physics of theories that explain everything we can see. We have observations across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. From about the 70s onwards, a lot of progress has been driven by improving sensitivity. We went from, a, if you compare, say, the Anglo-Australian telescope in 1976 when it's commissioned to today, the same telescope is, what, a thousand times more powerful, more than a thousand in some measures, yeah. because of charge coupled device detectors, wider fields of view. But we're now up, you know, we're about as good as it can be, right? Yeah, so. so if that's run out, we, there's no more spectrum to explore. Yeah. Um, physics is not going to give us any more insights on things we can see on a day-to-day -day basis. And our sensitivity is already nearly 100%. Where do we go? So that's one possible boundary. Um, I think that can be overcome if we go into space. If we start, we might just have to build really big telescopes. So on a 100-year time scale, I'm expecting telescopes with collecting areas of hundreds of square kilometers floating in orbit around Pluto or something like that. Interferometers out there. If wow. we have that which will require a breakthrough in rocket technology. Absolutely, yes. But that's not impossible. Um, I think there's no fundamental physical reason why we can't get things into space at a 
hundred times cheaper than at the moment. There's no, if you just do the sh energy calculations, it's a technological problem, but there's no fundamental physical law. What's making our telescopes on Earth that much better, there are fundamental physical barriers yeah. that are going to come across. But then that leaves us with the other barrier, which is how smart humans are. And we've got the problem that the total volume of astronomical knowledge, in fact, volume of knowledge across all the sciences, is doubling roughly every eight or ten years. And we're not getting double, twice as smart every eight or ten years, speaking for myself. Yeah. Um, so how do we deal with this? So uh, if you want to learn to the cutting edge now in a four-year degree, it's going to take eight years, a decade from now, and it's going to take God knows how many years, 100 years from now, the response humans have made is to become more specialised. Right. So we are far more specialised. In Galileo's time, one person could be across all the sciences. By the time of someone like Maxwell or Einstein, you could be maybe across all of physics. Um, but nowadays, people can't be even across all of astrophysics. They'd be specialising in, say, supernovae or quasars or something like that. One dreads to think how specialised we have to be 100 years from now. And that's going to be a real problem, I think. But It'll maybe be a bottleneck. Do you think it's going to be a bottleneck to what we're able to do? Yes, because so often the unexpected discoveries happen from cross-fertilisation between different yeah. fields. And if we have to learn just about a very, very narrow field, it may be that the human brain is going to be what limits us. And that's where computers are going to come into. I mean, we don't know whether the Moore's law improvement to computers is going to keep going for 100 years. Most likely it'll hit some sort of bottleneck at some point. But if it keeps going even 30 years or so, we're going to have computers that are, in some respects, smarter than us. Though normally the, the greatest achievement is not from computers versus humans, it's from the human-computer hybrid. And we're already kind of at that situation. There's no way we could process data from SkyMapper telescope without that very intricate interweaving of human brains and computer brains, each doing what they're best at. And that's going to get just more impressive, I think. So maybe what we're going to be looking at is almost like cyborg astronomers, where yep. probably not physical implants, but some combination of using the best elements of computers and the best of humans. And it'll be very interesting to see how that plays You're out. You're worried about, uh, how do I say, the uh, machines taking over? Uh, yes. Yes? Uh, I think it'd be foolish not to be. Um, yep. Part of me devoutly hopes that Moore's Law runs out of steam sometime in the next 20 or 30 years and leaves humans in charge of the world. But in some sense, would that be so bad? I mean, at least in terms of astronomy, if we have computers that are smarter than us, we can sit back and watch the MOOCs they produce and see the wonders they come back. And uh, um, if there are, there are, we normally are not disappointed if our children are smarter than we are, and maybe we should not be disappointed if our creations of computers can do things that we can't. Okay, I, 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 I will say the whole thing kind of scares me, but uh, we're always scared of the future, I guess.